So this is kind of timely. I noticed in some of the the chats that uh, talking about bulbs pop popping and, and greening greening up, we call that phenology. And that's one of my job titles as state climatologist, as actually written in Iowa code, uh, the study of phenology, uh, when the natural cycle of uh, plants uh, starts during the spring uh, and how it's impacted by various weather and climatic issues. Uh, so tonight uh, we'll be discussing our extremes, the new normal, and a brief look at observed and modeled trends and the evolving risk landscape that we see in terms of agriculture and various sectors across the state, including gardening and anything that involves uh, plants. Uh, I'm housed at the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. I'm currently in my office in the basement of the Wallace Building at the Des Moines, at the Capitol Complex in Des Moines. It makes sense to keep a meteorologist and a climatologist in the basement, but here I am. So I'll get started. So our presentation will revolve around the climate system and changes in the climate system and those impacts that we see on weather extremes, whether wet or dry, uh, cold or warm. First, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show a few slides on planetary general circulation, what the, the Earth looks like in terms of the atmosphere and the various implications of dynamics in the atmosphere and how those large scale dynamics filter down into our weather events that we see across the state. Then I'll talk about uh, our climatological trends uh, in right behind me, I have records that go back to uh, 1872 for temperature and precipitation. Some of our oldest uh, stations are in Muscatine and Fort Madison go back into the mid 1800s as the US Army was moving westward and forts were being established. Then I'll look at wet and dry extremes. Uh, wetter extremes, given that a warming atmosphere holds more water vapor and more water vapor in the atmosphere produces more extreme wet events, but also uh, ironically enough, more dry extremes or drought. And then I'll talk about drought because that's one of the big issues that we see across the state over the last 190 weeks. This has been the longest drought that we've seen in Iowa since uh, a drought that occurred in 1954. Uh, through the end of the 50s. And then we'll look at climate projections and implications. Projections on temperature, precipitation, humidity, severe weather, and what they will mean as we move into the middle to end of the 21st century. Uh, so to first get you oriented, it's easy to talk about general circulation features uh, on Earth when we use other planets. This is Jupiter on the left-hand side from the Hubble uh, visible image, and on the right, the James Webb Space Telescope, infrared. And as you can see, various banding on Jupiter. There are actually nine, nine bands in the northern hemisphere of Jupiter, nine in the southern hemisphere of Jupiter. And given that it's a gas giant without any kind of rocky core, uh, it's easier to see the chemical constituents of the atmosphere of Jupiter. And of course, you have the great red spot here uh, that is a large scale low pressure system that is larger than Earth. These are would be similar to low pressure or hurricanes that we would get on Earth in the tropical belt. Uh, one other thing to look at, you can actually see the aurora in the northern and southern hemisphere of uh, Jupiter. So our planets behave similarly in that we have cellular features on Earth as well. Planets also have polar vortices or, or, or the polar vortex. If you look at Saturn, it has a nice hexagonal feature. You can also see banding across Saturn. Uh, because of the fluid dynamics on a gas giant is the same as the fluid dynamics on a rocky body such as Earth. Uh, as I when I was at Iowa State, I taught uh, intro meteorology when I was doing my PhD, uh, but also dynamics, fluid dynamics uh, in atmospheric science uh, for seniors and grad students. So if we look at the Earth, the reason why we can't see banding on the Earth is because the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. A majority of the consist constituency of the atmosphere is nitrogen. And of course, you have oxygen and carbon dioxide and uh, water vapor anywhere from zero to 4% water vapor on Earth, and we're increasing that amount given a warming atmosphere. But the Earth is broken up into three bands. So we have the three bands per hemisphere. So we have the tropical uh, cell here, then we have the uh, mid-latitude cell or the feral cell, 
and then you have the polar cell. In each of these cells, um, you have unique wind features, uh, you have unique climatological features, such as the subtropical high or the Bermuda high, you have the Rocky Mountain low, and then you have the Aleutian low in, in, in the Pacific Basin. These semi-permanent features are, are kind of like the great red spot on Jupiter in that they dictate uh, planetary uh, storm tracks, especially if, when we're talking about the mid-latitudes, flow coming off the Pacific into the United States, uh, things like El Nino and La Nina and larger scale uh, climate drivers will impact where the storm track sets up. So right in the middle of the tropical cell in the northern and southern hemisphere is the doldrums or the windless region at the equator, and also the intertropical convergence zone or the ITZZ. We've heard of monsoons. Monsoon is the seasonal movement of the ITCC north or south. It follows the sun. Uh, another uh, interesting and a dominant driver in our climate system are the separations between the cells. The separations between the polar and west or the mid latitude cell is the polar jet stream. And likewise, between the mid latitude cell and the tropical cell is the subtropical jet. So these two jet stream features impact the weather that we see across the United States. Just as an example, in strong El Nino years, as we're in, the polar uh, jet stays further north, the subtropical jet stays flat across the, uh, the Gulf states, Florida and California. We've heard of the atmospheric river. This is part of uh, the El Nino pattern that we're currently in in winter. We get all that warm air in between and hence we're working on a very warm winter, uh, perhaps the uh, third warmest winter on record for the state of Iowa going back 152 years. We still have to get through February, uh, but this might be a lost winter for us. Now, I mentioned those semi-permanent pressure features on Earth that kind of guide uh, different weather behavior. We have the Bermuda High and then the Aleutian High, the Rocky Low, and then uh, the, the Upper uh, Canadian Archipelago Low. Uh, these large scale features are, are not there on a daily basis, but if we take an average of pressure over uh, the year or over a given time period, these features show up. Uh, so for example, when we're talking about tropical activity, uh, depending on where the Bermuda High sets up, we can get more landfalling hurricanes if the Bermuda High is further west in the Atlantic Basin, or we can get less landfalling hurricanes if the Bermuda High is further east in the Atlantic Basin. So this is one of the drivers that we see of weather for the United States. If we have more landfalling uh, hurricanes during the uh, Atlantic season and the Gulf season, you get more precipitation across the mid-Atlantic states uh, because of these systems dragging in a lot of moisture. And sometimes that can block the Gulf of Mexico off the moisture gate that we get from the Gulf into the mid-latitudes, into the Midwest, I should say. And that's where we start to see drier conditions and drought formation. Okay, so now we're now that you're all experts on general circulation of the Earth, and again, that's a full semester class in college, uh, we're going to switch to temperature and precipitation trends. And again, these are tied in uh, to what we see uh, in terms of weather and climate across uh, the United States. So if we look at the uh, annual or the global land and ocean temperature anomalies, again, this is how much above or below uh, the average we are. And as a climatological decade, we use the last full three decades. So our current climate decade is 1991 uh, to 2020, the last full three decades. Uh, the lower the blue bar here, and again, the anomalies in degrees Fahrenheit. So the lower the blue bar, the colder the year. Uh, compared to climatology, the higher the red bar, the warmer the year was compared to climatology. You can see at the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s, generally cooler than average years, colder years. Uh, and that's striking because you can have a globally cool year and still have hot spots across the globe. And we think about uh, the 1930s, the Dust Bowl, a very warm and very dry period along with the, gl the globe itself being relatively colder than average. So again, you, we talk about warm extremes and cold extremes, these polar outbreaks during winter, 
with these polar outbreaks, the colder air mo moving into the mid-latitude, uh, we can still see those in a warming environment with climate change. And in fact, the extremes are becoming more extreme, whether they're cold extremes or warm extremes. Then you start to see in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, we're ramping up the temperature anomaly. We're starting to get close to one degree. Now, in the early 40s, partially that was responsible because of an El Nino event, a, a strong El Nino event. So you'll see years on the temporal record in which you have warmer years because of El Nino. El Nino is warmer sea surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific. Those can act to warm the atmosphere as well and get a warmer global temperature as we're seeing this year and as we saw in 2016. But as we get past the 60s, 70s, we really start to see that global temperature anomaly ramp up pretty precipitously uh, to almost two degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, as we get into the 21st century. So temperature will be a very uh, important factor when we talk about moisture availability in the atmosphere and the amount of moisture that can be held in the atmosphere. Uh, so if we look at the observed U.S. temperature change since 1895 when the federal record starts, this is again in degrees Fahrenheit. The darker the reds, the higher the temperature rise. So you see across the state, uh, anywhere from a, a degree to a degree and a half since 1895. You look across the upper Midwest and even in even into Alaska into the high latitudes, more warming. This is a function of what we call Arctic amplification. As the Arctic loses sea ice, we've all parked in parking lots in summertime and put the visor up on our windshield. That prevents incoming solar radiation from getting into our car and that greenhouse effect raising those temperatures up. Uh, the summer sea ice or the sea ice sheet up on the Arctic, in fact, acts as the Northern Hemisphere's air conditioner. And as we lose that sea ice because of Arctic warming and atmospheric warming, we start to ingest more solar radiation into the uh, Arctic Basin, you're melting the sea ice from the bottom bottom up and then the top down, uh, you're, you get a positive feedback, you enhance the warming. So the Arctic is warming two to threes, two to three degrees warm uh, faster than the mid-latitudes where we live. When that happens, that temperature gradient between the mid-latitudes where we live and the high latitude re relaxes and you start to have meanders that can form in the jet. And that's where we see more persistent behavior forming. When the jet is stuck in a given location, that's where you can get into wetter patterns. As we did in 2018 across the northern third of the state, record wetness, uh, the wettest year on record for the northern three tier of counties in Iowa. And then you go to southeastern Iowa, D3 drought on a scale of D0 to D4. Drought you wouldn't see but 30 to 40 years, once but 30 to 40 years. So you'd only need to move four or five counties north or south to be in one historic extreme or another. So what we're seeing in the climate system are extremes locking in more persistently, but also closer in time period and in spatial scales where they occur actually on, uh, on Earth. Now, if we look at the Iowa average temperature since 1895, and the average temperature is the daytime high plus the overnight low, and then you divide it by two, gives us a good climatological baseline to rank events. On this map, the higher the peak, the warmer the year, the lower the valley, the colder the year. The blue line is the trend, so uh, about a tenth of a degree per decade increase since 1895. So overall, as a state, we're about 1.3 degrees warmer uh, than we were at the end of the 1800s. Now, an interesting thing happens if you decouple the maximum temperature, so think daytime high, versus those overnight low temperatures, no trend in the daytime max temperatures. We haven't warmed up during the day on an annual basis. Now, of course, we have seen warming in the winter, our fastest warming season, both daytime highs and overnight lows given a warming atmosphere. But overall, if you average all months together, no trend. Where we do see the trend is that minimum temperature, the overnight low. More water vapor in the atmosphere, more cloud cover locks in that daytime high temperature like a blanket. We don't cool off as much overnight, and hence we do see a rise, two-tenths of a degree increase in um, the overnight low temperature. Now, why that's important is a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. We get more evaporation because of warmer air. 
more evaporation, more water vapor available in the atmosphere, more precipitation. So generally, via the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, which is a physical relationship of temperature and moisture, a one degree Fahrenheit increase typically, typically gives us 4% more water vapor available in the atmosphere. So remember that Clausius-Clapeyron equation when we talk about extremes and the projected temperature rises that we'll see in the low emission scenario and high emission scenario, because we'll get um, some new physical feedback in terms of how moisture is precipitated out. More moisture availability in the atmosphere uh, has to have more water vapor loading to reduce a meteorological event. And hence, we've seen more extreme rainfall events, more precipitation events, uh, intense precipitation events versus historically um, several decades out. Now, if we look at the uh, annual average temperature trend since 1895, uh, blue line again is the uh, the trend, the higher the peak, the wetter the year, 1993, the wettest year on record for Iowa, followed by uh, 2018 and 2019, the second and 12th wettest years on record. Put those two years together, the wettest two calendar years since uh, observational records were kept. That two years, and now we're in the working on the fourth year of drought. So this tells you that our extremes are locking in more often. But if you look at the the trend line across the state, about four tenths of an inch increase in precipitation across the state. Now this isn't homogenous across the state. There are locations that are getting wetter. There are locations that are getting drier uh, versus history. But overall, we see a, a positive increase in precipitation. So I mentioned climate decades. We're currently in the 1991 to 2020 climate decade. But if we were to look at the previous climate decade, 1981 to 2010, and subtract that from the current climate decade, temperature on the left, precipitation on the right, again, these are change plots or anomalies. Uh, what we see, redder colors across much of the state, we've seen about uh, you know, a three-tenths of a degree increase to a half a degree increase uh, across the state. Uh, colder conditions across the Dakotas into Montana, and that's a reflection of more precipitation, more cloud cover, cooler temperatures. Overall, you look at the upper Midwest, a general trend for more precipitation annually. Why that's important is all that moisture flows south once it falls. Uh, we have the unique boundary system here in Iowa in that we have the eastern and western boundaries, two of the largest rivers in the northern hemisphere, the Missouri and the Mississippi. So when we look at these increases in precipitation with the trends and in the projections, flooding, aerial flooding is going to be of concern along with drought as we move into the middle to end of the 21st century. Another particularly interesting thing to look at, desert southwest, warming temperatures, but also drying out over the last 10 years. We've seen a pretty precipitous drop in the amount of precipitation that we've seen in the desert southwest and in California. And this is reflected in uh, prior to this year, very low reservoir levels, record forest fires, and record mega drought across um, the uh, West Coast. Now, if we look at proxy months for agriculture, April, let's talk about row crops, uh, spring planting, October harvest in July, when row crops are uh, maturing and also the warmest month. What we see in April in October are generally wetter conditions. So our springs and our falls are trending wetter, especially spring. Where we've seen an anomaly in the last 10 years when we subtract the last climate decade from the current is that this big bullseye of below average rainfall. We've actually seen a dip in July rainfall. Uh, and that's this is concerning in that July is climatologically the warmest month for Iowa and for many Midwestern states. So when you see a dip in rainfall and an increase in temperature, that's where you can see drought conditions rapidly expand. You get into flash drought or that rapid onset drought is more likely in a warmer and drier uh, environment. Now, if we look at the 20th century and then each iteration of those climate decades from the 100 year average, what you can see as we move left to right 
and then from the bottom left to right again is we're seeing generally wetter conditions form annually, especially in the 1971 to 20, uh, 2000 climate decade on, we see a, a big shift in the amount of precipitation that we see in the upper Midwest. Now, even with an increase in the amount of precipitation, and this is in percent, so let's say 5, 10, 15% increase across the upper Midwest, a lot of this can fall in a, in a smaller time scale, run off more readily, and we can still see pervasive droughts, even in the presence of a wetter, wetter environment overall. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, so when we talk about the clausius clafron equation, uh, water vapor loading in a warmer atmosphere, we have to talk about precipitation extremes. So typically at any National Weather Service co-op station, we'll experience one to two days in which we see uh, a, a percentile event. We would say two inches or more of uh, rainfall or precipitation in general at a, at a given location. If we take the last two decades and look at the trend in those two plus inch rainfall events, we're actually seeing them become more numerous and more intense. So higher intensity uh, in a smaller spatial scale. So you're getting rain events uh, over a smaller region or portion of the state. Uh, and that has implications on, even if you have a, a higher statewide average for precipitation, there are gonna be some uh, stations in the state that miss out. And with these higher intensity events, they have of course impacts on urban and suburban stormwater and flooding. Uh, the infrastructure that we have built is not built for the precipitation events that we're seeing now. We're about 30 to 40 years talking with city managers and, and urban planners. They talk about this infrastructure and the, the, abil the, uh, the inability for these storm drains and the large scale infrastructure to keep up with these uh, events. Also soil runoff from uh, rainfall events over bare soils. That's why we push cover crops. We push no-till practices to lock that soil in where it is because Iowa soils are some of the richest on earth. They can hold a lot of water. So it's a, a actually a buffer when we do get in drier periods that we have access to surpluses of water when we do, uh, when we are available to store that water in the soil profiles. Also large scale downstream flooding, we think of the bomb cyclone in March of 2019 record flooding, Southwestern Iowa, 2008, 2011 Cedar Rapids, and again in Southwestern Iowa, and, and then of course, 1993, these styles of floods. Uh, if you look at, uh, I pulled Central Iowa because that includes Ames in, in Des Moines. Uh, the, to orient you on this plot, the frequency is on the left. So the frequency of an event occurring over 24 hours, horizontal axis is the uh, the amount of precipitation that you get over that 24 hour period. Blue bar is historic. 20 the 20 year uh, trend is the red bar. So we have gentle rainfall events, uh, an inch or less in the very far left side here, and then three plus inch rainfall events over 24 hours on the far right. What we've seen historically versus oops historically versus the 20 year average is that the shift in frequency from gentle rainfall events to more extreme rainfall events. So historically, about 89, 90% of the time, we see gentle rainfall events going back to 1895. Well, we've shifted that 2% uh, further right. So you look at these three plus inch rainfall events, historically, a 0.01% uh, probability of occurrence, very small probability. But over the last 20 years, we've tripled that probability. So even a small uh, probability, tripling it is significant and it tells you something is shifting in the climate system. Uh, this is one event that we use as a proxy. This is the Ankeny, June 30th, 2018 event into July 1st. To orient you, here's Polk County, here's Story County. Uh, I'm about right here in my office. Uh, we're in Clive and Ankeny here, so western and northern suburbs, anywhere from eight to 10 inches over three hours. My rain gauge uh, just north of the city had 5.3 inches over three hours. Uh, so a very intense rainfall event. Uh, Clive, which is a western suburb, had 1993 level flooding over 45 minutes to two hours. 
So rapid intensification of flooding, uh, given the infrastructure that we have. So we're seeing these events not that often, but much more often than we've seen historically. So if we look at the five-year average precipitation behavior, going back historically, we take five-year chunks. Uh, and to orient you on this plot, this is the total annual precipitation in inches. So up from, from basically, let's say, 28 inches up to 40 inches. The statewide average varies from that 28 inches uh, northwest to 36 inches, 38 inches southeast. Uh, these bars represent the five-year averaging period, and the dots give us uh, the actual annual values for that five-year slice. So over the last 16 years, we've seen an increase in those annual precipitation events. The five-year time slices have become wetter uh, since the 2006-2010 interval. And then you go back into the 1950s, 1952 to 1956, and then adding on the additional five years, getting into the end of the 50s, the driest uh, interval of time. And hence, that corresponds to the, the last four-year-plus drought that we saw across the state. Uh, so what we're seeing is an increase in that five-year precipitation trend. So wetter periods as we march on uh, into the uh, first part of the 21st century. Now, if we look at those, again, the two-inch daily extreme events, um, this is 1900 to 2020. We haven't had enough in the uh, current decade to add on to these the bar charts. But the horizontal black line here shows the long-term average about one and a half days. So I mentioned you look across the National Weather Service co-op stations across the state, one to two of those 95th percentile events uh, per year. Uh, if you look at multi-year averages since 2005, we're actually in the highest part of the historical record. We're seeing wetter extremes, wetter years in general, wetter five-year segments, but again, higher intensity events more often versus his historical trends going back into the late 1800s and the early 1900s. If we look at seasonality, spring precipitation on the left, summer precipitation on the right, and again, this is observed, uh, we look at March, April, May as spring, and then June, July, August as uh, summertime rainfall since 1895. The, the annual records for the period, 9.2 inches for spring, 12.5 12 inches for summer. We've seen in both spring and summer precipitation increases above the average, the historical average since 1990 for spring and 2005 for summer. Now, summer is kind of deceiving in that, if you remember back a few slides, we're actually seeing a dip in July rainfall. Uh, more precipitation in May and June, the two wettest months for the state, less in July, the warmest month for the state climatologically, and then a slight uptick in rainfall in August. So we're kind of removing uh, the deficits that we're picking up over the last 10 years in August are in July with more precipitation in June and August. Now that August increase in precipitation is much needed given what we've seen in the last 10 years. You look at the previous climate decade, 1981 to 2010 for July uh, precipitation, you see a big portion of the state South Central up into North Central Iowa, four plus inch rainfalls in July, up to five inches. Currently the statewide average for July is 4.17 inches. So we've been well above that for much of the state uh, in the previous climate decade. But what you notice in the current climate decade is a bifurcation or a split in that behavior. Much drier potential across Central Iowa, uh, you see wetter conditions in Missouri and then a shift northwest or northeast uh, into Wisconsin, uh, southern Minnesota and northeastern Iowa. This is a function of the storm track and the jet stream being further north. And that's where we see the storm track lock in and more precipitation. 
But again, if you difference those two climate decades, you get that big bullseye of deficits, anywhere from a five to 10% increase across the state, up to 20% in given pockets where you see those darker browns. Uh, so that leads us into the drought vulnerability index. This is again is a, based on exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Row crops across the state, we don't irrigate. We don't have that we don't have that uh, widespread behavior across the state for irrigation of our our farmlands. Uh, that puts us at a higher sensitivity to drought conditions. Also, the adaptive capacity, uh, building more infrastructure for irrigation, we don't have that on a large scale. Also exposure, that 10 year decrease in July rainfalls has a higher probability of drought forming and intensifying during the hottest month of the year climatologically. So this was an impetus for us to rewrite, in fact, write the Iowa drought plan, which is currently in use given the drought that we're in. Uh, I have a full another hour of presentation on the Iowa drought plan. But given that we wrote the drought plan with Homeland Security and the DNR, uh, this is the newest drought plan for any of the 50 states and actually a model for the states around us. So it's a, it's a positive talking point for our state agencies. Uh, we're coordinating amongst ourselves with the, the same messaging and then table topping and game planning drought for water shortages in municipalities uh, to uh, water cutoffs for uh, animal production, especially Northwestern Iowa. We're coming up with solutions and, and mitigation things that we can do if drought persists. And once we know that drought is going to be with us, even in a wetter environment. Okay, so right now I'll talk about the drought of 2012 versus 2024. 20, uh, give us an idea and I'll kind of move through this because I have a few more slides with the climate uh, projections. This is the current U.S. drought monitor depiction. You can see a D3 corridor in northwestern or northeastern and eastern Iowa. We've had good improvement over the last uh, several weeks. If you were to look at this uh, drought depiction this year, uh, last year at this time, D3 conditions and even D4 in northwestern Iowa. Uh, so we've seen a real shift east of drought conditions. This just tells you how fast drought can form, but also how fast we can improve drought conditions. I showed this already. This is a time series of drought. You'll note in the in between 2012 and our current drought, generally quiet conditions. So we we entered a, a wetter period, uh, and then got into a drier period. The pendulum swinging faster back and forth, and giving us these extremes, whether wet or dry, but also together, as I mentioned with 2018. Uh, why this drought is different than 2012, in that. The second wave of the drought was where it was most pervasive. Longer term precipitation deficits were unearthed and you get into widespread crop failure and widespread hydrological impacts. We haven't seen that this year on a large scale. Now, of course, we've had farmers and producers and gardeners impacted by the drought that we've seen across the state, but we've had ebb and flow over the last 190 weeks. Improvement, but also degradation. We're currently in the fifth wave of this. Um, but we have seen some improvement over the last several weeks. Why this is interesting, if you compare the last two droughts, or the last periods leading up to the last two droughts, they've been particularly wet. Leading up to 2012, 2007 to 2010 was the wettest period to that point, wettest four to five years that we've seen in Iowa. You look at the years leading up to the 2020 drought, 2018 and 2019, again, combined, the wettest two calendar years on record. So you're replenishing our deep aquifers, the shallow alluvials as well, but you're also producing soil moisture reserves as we start to dry out, um, getting into uh, the current drought. Okay, so now we'll look at climate project projections and I'll try to leave enough time uh, for questions if we have them. These again, climate projections are our global climate models and our regional climate models various parameterizations, various time scales that we run them on, various spatial scales that we run them on to give us solutions, meaning mathematical solutions, the climate projections and temperature and precipitation that we can anticipate uh, over the next several decades. Uh, so uh, 
kind of bridging the observed trends to the model trends. Uh, this is a busy plot, so I'll get you oriented here. Vertical axis is the temperature change in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the vertical or the horizontal axis is the time period, again, late 1800s through the end of the 21st century. The orange line here is the ob observed temperature uh, behavior that we get from our National Weather Service co-op stations across the state. So you can see variability. We've had cold years, we've had warm years. Uh, and then this gray shading here, this is actually taking the climate models and running them back. So we model the, the historical record. And as you can see, that orange line falls generally within that range of temperatures. So that's showing us that the physics and the thermodynamics and the fluid dynamics in these climate models are acting as they physically should in the atmosphere. So that gives us that gives us good confidence as we run them out. Uh, of course, the farther out you run, the less numerical certainty you get. But this gives us a good idea that the models are behaving as the physical environment should. Now we have the lower emission scenario. So if we uh, uh, rain fossil fuels in uh, uh, anthropogenic sources versus the higher emission scenario, the developing world continues industrialization, uh, more uh, particulate, more CO2 in the atmosphere, more uh, radiative forcing in the atmosphere. That's where we see the higher probability of, of warmer temperatures. So if we look at 2050, middle of the century, on the lower emission scenario, anywhere from a one and a half degree increase all the way up to the potential to seven and a half degree increase. On the higher emission scenario, we're up to 10 degrees. <clears throat> so remembering back to Klaus's Clapron equation, Let's say you're increasing in the middle there uh, of three to five degree increase towards 2050. That's up to 15% or uh, three times 4%. That's up to 12% more water vapor availability in the atmosphere. Again, more water vapor loading to produce a meteorological event. So we can expect more extreme type of rainfalls, even when we do see an increase in the amount of precipitation that we see across the upper Midwest. So if we look at mid-century warming, I showed you the observed plot here. Both the lower and the, the higher emission scenario show a warming of anywhere from uh, two to five degrees across the Midwest. And again, this ties in physically, pure physics, to the amount of water vapor available in the atmosphere. So more water vapor, more cloud cover, but also more low-level humidity, and we'll get into that. If we look at the CMIP, CMIP-6 global climate models, these are the state-of-the-art climate models that we use uh, in the IPCC reports and other, other studies, assessments. We're looking at temperatures by mid-century in which we exceed 95 degrees, and this is the higher emission scenario. Uh, so towards the mid-century, and just to orient you, if you look at the trends of 95 degree days currently, they're basically flatlined. We haven't seen an increase. And this gets into the warming hole, which I can't get into now because it's it's uh, too much into the weeds and I don't have enough time. Uh, but once that warming hole collapses in the Midwest, we can expect, if the climate models are correct, anywhere from 15 to 30 days more per year in which our daily high temperature is greater than 95 degrees. Uh, Another thing we look at are disease danger days. So with a warmer environment, uh, we're actually increasing the um, hospitality that we have across the state for non-native species. We're getting pests that are mo moving further north like armyworm, also mosquitoes that spread different types, West Nile virus, Zika virus. We're seeing since 1970 uh, days in which mosquitoes can transmit these dangerous viruses, a 15 day increase. And this was up to 2017. So we could expect that probably is in the range of 17 to 20 more days per year in which we see more uh, disease risk spread. Another thing we look at are the projections and precipitation change by season. If you look at winter, spring and summer, we see a high probability in the climate models of a increase percent wise in the amount of precipitation that we see. The uh, distressing part of this trend is in summertime, when you see broadly 
a decrease in the amount of summer precipitation, summer rainfall across the United States. Uh, again, this has implications on drought. This has implications on uh, agriculture. This has implications on warm days and heat waves when we can't cool off heat index values. All of that ties into the warming and dry, drier, drying out of summertime as we move past the middle of the century. <clears throat> I also mentioned higher humidity. I'm uh, Early on, I'm, uh, I noted the Bermuda High, which is out in the Atlantic. We've seen a shift of that Bermuda High further east, which acts to draw in more Gulf moisture, uh, or further west, I should say, and then the Rocky Mountain High also moving further east. When that happens, you get a basically a vacuum of moisture that is being sucked into the upper Midwest, and hence we see uh, higher humidities, higher low-level humidities, especially with corn sweats, uh, but also we reduce the range of daily temperatures, more cloud cover, more precipitation. You're, you're decreasing the range of temperatures between the daytime and nighttime, and this has implication on heat waves as well. Uh, if you look at projected changes in those top one percentile events, lower emission scenario across the state, generally 20, 25% increase in those one percentile events, let's say three to four inch rainfall events over 24 hours. Higher emission scenario, we're getting in the 30 plus uh, percent change range. Again, more water vapor in the atmosphere in a warming environment, you're getting these higher intensity events more often. Uh, I get out, asked often about number of derechos we can expect in the future, number of wind events. <clears throat> Overall, if we look at the number of days in which severe thunderstorm environments are present, in which we can feed thunderstorms to produce severe weather, uh, where we've seen a, a statistically significant increase is in the March, April, May timeframe. We're warming up spring. We have more water vapor, more instability in the atmosphere. And as such, we have an atmosphere that's more prone for severe weather events. Uh, an interesting th feature pops out again in June, July, and August. And again, this might be related to the warming hole or the lack of warming that we've seen in summertime to date. Now, again, this warming hole is projected to collapse over the next several decades, but we've actually seen a decrease in those days in which we can see severe weather in the summertime. Uh, but you look at DJF with these dots in, in uh, September, October, November, we're seeing a slight uptick getting into the cold season of more severe weather potential. And again, this is tied in with a warming environment and more water vapor. If we look at trends in tornadoes since 1955 through uh, the middle of the last decade, <clears throat> the black line here are days at which we have at least one tornado in Tornado Alley. The red line is days in which we have more than 30 tornadoes or a tornado outbreak. We've seen a decrease in those one-off tornado events, or you see two or three tornadoes across the state. Where we've seen that increase are the tornado outbreaks. If you remember back uh, December 15th, 2021, 63 tornadoes across the state of Iowa, the highest outbreak for any month for Iowa the highest December outbreak for the United States in observational record. Uh, so we're seeing an uptick in the atmospheric components that can provide widespread instability, spin, and uh, lift to produce widespread tornado outbreaks. Now, our tornado outbreaks are luckily not as devastating as EF3, EF4, EF5 outbreaks that we see in Dixie Alley or a shift in Tornado Alley further southeast but we have seen an uptick in the possibility of tornado outbreaks. Uh, another key indicator that's a, a huge for agriculture, both for gardeners and, and for row crop farmers, we've seen an increase in the growing season, any, anywhere from 15 to 20 days projected. With that though, we see uh, an increase in the amount of consecutive dry days or days in which we don't see any rainfall or precipitation and a change in the number of hot nights. We've seen an increase in hot nights. And again, that's where we see the overall annual increase in, in temperature across the, the state. <clears throat> so our trend summary, long-term and 30-year trends both show an increase in temperature and precipitation across the state. Higher intensity events are on the increase. 
<clears throat> spring and autumn rainfalls are increasing. Winter is the fastest warming season. We're seeing less snowfall, more rainfall in winter type mix events, less tornado days, but more tornado outbreaks uh, in, in the cards for Tornado Alley. And then looking at changes in the climate system, trends and projections show a global mean temperature will increase throughout the 21st century. Now, again, these temperature changes won't be uniform across the globe. We'll see colder pockets. We'll also see warmer pockets. This has to do with topography, with specific regional impacts. Uh, looking at the United States, we're situated Gulf of Mexico, warm, moist air south, cold Canadian air that's dry, coming together in the middle of the continent. We have different types of circulation features as opposed to Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, but overall, we will see a whole scale warming in the, in the uh, global climate. And as the global temperature increases, we'll see more hot extremes, generally less fewer extremes, uh, both daily on, and on that seasonal time scale. So we can think of less polar outbreaks, but more heat waves as we approach the end of the 21st century. And then, of course, precipitation will be on the increase given the clausius clapron relationship with uh, atmospheric warming and the amount of water vapor available as well. Here is my contact information. I'm always happy to chat on the phone or send me an email. Um, thank you for being a captive audience and I will take any questions.